so today I'll be talking kind of broadly about um, the status right now of patents in biotech with regard to DNA sequences, and then kind of more specifically in the space, the um, leading up to and since the big Myriad decision in 2013, which you may, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. Um, so Latin is kind of used a lot in the legal field, so my Latin is a bar beware is that um, patent law is really, really complicated, and so I'm going to try to keep this discussion relatively narrow. Um, and in the same way that uh, scientists don't really appreciate the scope of patent law, um, there's a, kind of a reverse problem that a lot of the judicial system, including the Supreme Court, uh, has a lack of knowledge about molecular biology. And this was kind of like in, in the, the abstract, basically, of the Supreme Court's uh, decision of the Myriad uh, case. This is really clear when they had an error uh, <laughs> DNA, deposit DNA. Um, it turns out when they submit stuff and you read it on SCOTUS blog, which I really recommend that site, it's <laughs> amazing. This is a draft, so they corrected it. So, uh, so first I'd like to really briefly uh, talk about just like what a patent is, and uh, I think a lot of uh, that is actually really important for later points. And if anyone wants to jump in with questions or like uh, comments to add, um, please feel free. Uh, so first, like a patent fundamentally is a temporary monopoly, and uh, so a patent is so the monopoly that you have for about 20 years from the date that you submit the patent. In most countries, in most cases, although although there are exceptions in which you can extend patent life. Um, secondly, a patent is a mechanism for converting an invention or uh, something you make into a property right. So it doesn't really give you ownership over the thing itself. It just uh, gives you a temporary property right to it. And that right uh, specifically is the right to exclude others from using, selling, or importing your invention by means of lawsuits. Uh, so again, it, it, as a monopoly, it's not that you know the government will step in and say, you know, you can't use that invention. It's giving, if you're the patent holder, the right to sue someone if they use it and, and remove costs and then kind of force them into a license agreement. <coughs> So where does this uh, come from, this, this idea of a patent? And it really fundamentally comes out with the Constitution, uh, and presumably British law before that. So there is a clause in the Constitution, which apparently was not discussed very much at the time. It was kind of just tacked on um, that the Congress has the right to um, promote science and useful arts uh, by giving people in limited times this limited monopoly uh, to inventors for their discoveries. And it's right that uh, corresponds to copyrights, which is the other side of intellectual property. So what is a patent not? Uh, I already said it's not ownership of an idea or even really permanent ownership of the invention. It's just this temporary right to sue people. Um, second, and kind of an important distinction that I really didn't know until I took up a patent in the course is that there are really fundamental differences between copyright. Um, first, most fundamentally, is a copyright, again, is not a right to an idea or own an idea. It's um, basically protecting your expression to uh, presentation of an idea, like the way you write words on a page. And the other really kind of fundamental, uh, other major difference, uh, which has a huge effect on, on patents versus copyrights, is the term length. Where, where patents are 20 years, uh, copyrights are much longer. Right now, it's, I think it's death plus 70 years, uh, which is crazy. But like 20 years makes a lot of sense, and uh, there's kind of uh, half jokes that noted that a lot of these extensions uh, correspond roughly to the time that the Mickey Mouse patent expires, you may have heard of. Um, and there's a lot of very successful uh, lobbying that's gone on to really extend that. It's and that prevents all what? It's all Disney's fault. Yeah, it's all Disney's fault. <laughs> it's probably other people too, but. Uh, so finally, another thing that a patent, is kind of obviously not, but it's kind of something that exists in, in a balance of patents and trade secrets. Um, so a patent really, since you have to submit a patent application and it's published, kind of analogous to a research paper, or more analogous to maybe a supplement to a paper, um, it's a mechanism for inventions to end in the public sphere, and as a patent expires to be used by people. Um, so they're both to incentivize, on one hand, people to do stuff that's useful for society and then for society to use it after. Of course, if the trade secret is kind of the opposite. Um, so on one hand, if something isn't patented, useful, it's probably going to be a trade secret and vice versa, so there's always going to be a kind of balance between the two. Um, and as a side note, uh, for biotech companies, 
Um, a lot of cell lines are not patented. They're effectively trade sequence, uh, secrets. And oftentimes, companies will not even sequence their genome sequencing uh, to avoid that information kind of getting out there if they, can, they don't have to. So another big fundamental thing about patents that's useful to keep in mind is, yeah. So with the sequencing, why can't someone purchase the cell line sequences themselves? Because they don't give out the cell. Like, so if they use like Cho oh. cells or Chinese hamster ovary cells, they'll just like keep it in a lock and key. I see. And it's just some so variant like, that they've passaged or improved. They have some way of make it be the equivalent of having like a non-disclosure agreement or something. Yeah, like and I'm sure there's a lot of like like, like non-disclosure agreements and like ways that people um, uh, keep a tap on that. So it's just like a black box. Like they don't know exactly what it is. They're just like this thing works. I'm sure it's not a black box. And that 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 story was kind of stuff I've heard from other people in our lab that work with companies directly, but I'm sure there's a consideration of like the more information you know at, about certain things, the more information you spread, um, people will eventually leave, and even if they have agreements, then that information will get out there. Um, so this is actually another point: is that like um, there's a lot of stuff we'll talk about next is like what should and shouldn't be patented, and then also I won't talk about like uh, what patents should or should not be extended, which is another big issue. Like, those are important questions, but I, I think, like I'll pretty strongly say that I think patents are a good thing because they promote uh, information from being public when it's really financially valuable. Um, and, yeah. So who, so I said where the authority of, of the concept of a patent comes from, and then the, kind of the next big question is, who decides what can and can't be patented? And I mean, the, the answer is kind of the Constitution. It's basically Congress. They can almost do whatever they want. I'm sure they could like say only like men or only women could patent stuff. They could violate other things, but they could say like you couldn't patent a computer, anything on a computer, if they wanted to. They wouldn't do that because like I'm sure they can lobby. Uh, but they have pretty much exclusive authority. Um, so. After that, the branch of the executive branch, which uh, deals with patents, is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and they basically then uh, execute those laws, which some of which are vague, so there's a little bit of interpretation that they provide as well. And the Patent Office also issues guidelines saying that, like, you know, we currently believe, based on this law, that you can't patent this. And then they'll, if you submit an application, they might say, well, like, look at this law, look at this guideline, you can't patent this. And then, of course, like you know, if you don't like that, uh, you can go back to Congress and you call your congressperson and say, like, well, this isn't right. Um, can you please do something about this? Like, can you pass a law? And then finally, the courts, in addition to being the actual place where you settle patent disputes and get money if someone's violating your patent, they also, of course, interpret and clarify laws uh, when they're ambiguous, which in patent law, they're, they're really ambiguous all the time. So um, since Congress writes laws about patents, um, there's uh, really three sections of the U.S. Code, which is a kind of a codified form of the, the, a lot of U.S. laws, which focuses on patents. And this is really the focus of, of the, the Supreme Court cases, which you may have heard about, and things that will go forward. Um, the first is uh, Title 35, Section 101, which is just like known as Section 101 when people talk about it. And it, it basically just says that um, if you invent something um, and that's like if it's a manufacturer, composition of matter, and if it's new and useful, then you can patent it. You have a right to a patent. And then there are a lot of notes that say, like, you can't patent these things. So the, the big points about this is that um, right off the bat, there's a, a mention of it has to be new and it has to be useful. The new, new thing's kind of obvious. Um, the, useful, the useful point is actually think it's pretty subjective. And I saw some people discuss, like, um, this is not something that's typically challenged, but it, it, it's something you really do have to, like, establish and impact. And I think there's probably a lot of really interesting law there, which I really want to touch on. So the next section of the U.S. Code uh, 102 uh, concerns novelty, so, um, and which was kind of in 101 as well, so there's kind of cross these too. So, this section outlines that um, what you're trying to patent, it can't be something that's known, used, 
uh, previously or published on, either in our country or in other countries. Uh, published for academic researchers, if you discover something like, you know, something that's 10 times better than CRISPR, um, the key point is that you shouldn't have, that you should publish it before you talk to the patent office. Even if, you know, all you want to do is just give, <coughs> license it out to people for like one cent. Um, if you published on it, there's a good chance that the patent office will say, no, this is already, this is already known to everyone because you published it. Uh, the second point is that, um, kind of connected to the first point, is that a patent can't have been uh, contained an invention which was already submitted, either in the US or um, another country, uh, before your patent was submitted. This is called the first to file system, which you may have heard of. Uh, US until 2013 was a first to invent system, which means that if you had a lab notebook or something which said that like, well, I clearly discovered this and demonstrated like a data on this um, for this other person, even if they submitted it first, um, you could argue that you should, the patent should go to you. And this is like exactly what's going on right now with Donna, Jake, or CRISPR. Um, those, uh, that IP was all uh, submitted uh, before this first to file uh, system first to invent the first to file. Two days before. Two days before, which I'm sure was like completely intentional. <laughs> um, although it was just a bit fortuitous also at the time. Um, you could maybe argue that the first to invent system um, fundamentally makes more sense, but realistically the first to file system is just like e a lot easier for countries to deal with, especially now that we're in a global economy. Um, there's also something, I don't know if you know, there was something that, that um, Feng Jiang and the bro did where they leapfrogged um, down that by paying yeah, more yeah, money. Yeah. I, have, I have no idea how that uh, <laughs> ties into this first to file submission date stuff. So, uh, as I understand it, uh, Dabna and Berkeley submitted their patent two days before the first to file went along into effect. Uh, Feng Jiang uh -huh. and bro had submitted theirs some weeks or months later, but they like fast tracked it so that it would get reviewed more quickly. Mm -hmm. So there was about issue first, and because that was correctly, before the first file, everything went down. Yeah. So maybe, and don't quote me, but maybe if it was first to file system, it wouldn't have mattered who, if they did the expedited review. Yeah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have. Yeah. yeah. You, you can kind of see that why the system, like that battle would have been basically um, news. I mean, there would have been a lot of other discussions that were overlapping paths, I'm sure, but anyway. So the last point is kind of obvious, you have to be an inventor, you can't patent something to someone else. But. So novelty, it all kind of makes sense, and you can kind of imagine how a judge would de kind of decide, even if there's ambiguity at times, uh, what is it is novel or not. The really tricky one is non-obviousness. And uh, so it basically just states that, um, Invention, the difference between the invention and prior art, what has been previously used in society, um, can't have been often like an obvious next step. And this is just like, it's kind of necessary for the patent system, but it's also a mess legally to deal with. Um, and another uh, phrase people often use is that you need an inventive step or like a flash of insight, like kind of like Archimedes, like Eureka or something like that. Um, so examples of obvious invention, inventions, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter which said like, well, everyone uses round buckets and you just file a patent for square buckets, like that's obvious, like, like it shouldn't be patented. And then something which I think is a little more ambiguous is that there's a Supreme Court case back in the 1870s over um, the invention of the eraser-tipped pencil. Is that obvious or not? And they decided that it was obvious because people were using erasers and pencils and just like people knew that you could like tie them together. <laughs> uh, yeah. An interesting one for bio bricks. Yeah, there you, I mean, so non obviousness is, I think, a huge problem for biotech, and it's really not been litigated for a lot of the, the, the patents. Is this like a reasonable person standard? Like obvious to the reasonable person or to an expert in the field, right? It's, yeah. It's to one skilled in the art. One skilled in the art? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. The fact that two people discovered CRISPR at the same time, and George Church was like a month later, and yeah. there were like 40 other research groups in the country all doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Do you think the obvious next step was that we would use CRISPR to edit things? Right? Like I always thought that's an example of like completely not obvious, but like, yeah. 
But no one has an incentive there to say that that was obvious because everyone wants that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what are other things that do mark what you can and can't patent? So this is kind of all in the, the footnotes of these things, which uh, are pulling in various laws and like decisions. It's really confusing. Um, so historically, in Supreme Court cases, there's kind of four classes of things you can patent. The first is a composition of matter. If you like put together parts, like say you took apart a car, car and put them together in a way that like is completely non-obvious and creates an amazing um, I mean, this is also kind of a machine, that's something else you can patent. Um, a manufacturer, like you can think of this as like a method to patent, like a method to do Gibson assembly. Like I'm, I'm sure there's a patent for that. Um, and then a process, which the distinction between those two for me, I'm not sure. I'm sure what I'm going to do this. Um, things you can't patent. Uh, so again, a patent is not ownership of an abstract idea. That's pretty explicitly stated. Uh, also, and this really ties in the myriad case, laws of nature, so things in, in nature you can't, can't patent. There's some really weird historical back and forth, like I think aspirin was patented, um, the question of like if you extract things, is that patentable? Um, and then also like laws of nature and the more like, the way that I would read this, like you can't patent like an equation or something like that. And finally, there's a really big exception, just to show you that Congress can, just like say you can't patent this. Um, anything related to nuclear weapons, you can't patent. Anything classified. What? Anything classified. Yeah. Because it's full disclosure. Oh yeah, exactly. Yes. So, I mean, that's kind of obvious why. So the big question, um, which came about uh, really in the 1970s and 1980s, is what about if you modify organisms? So there was some precedent for that, and that the Congress passed an act I think in the mid-20th century that said that you can patent certain types of modified plants um, and Congress could do that. And so then uh, there was a, a Supreme Court case, uh, Diamond versus Chakrabarty, which is often just known as Chakrabarty, and it's like one of the two patent cases you should, you should know. Uh, the question of that case, which is again statutory, involves congressional laws and not a constitutional issue. And the, that question is, are genetic engineered organisms patentable under the US code? Um, this was, even though this is a really famous case and it's pretty solid law now, this was a 5-4 decision at the time. So the justices were, were very split on this question. And the holding was, yes, um, genetically modified organisms are patentable um, uh, as a composition of matter. So the facts of this case is uh, a researcher at GE um, and uh, Chakrabarty, who's now actually a professor at USC, turns out, um, was working on bioremediation. And it was known that you could combine different types of bacteria to, uh, to digest crude oil. And he uh, created an organism that could just do it all in one, one go. And so how he did that is he isolated plasmids, which, which express the genes that do that. And then, this is really not clear from his paper, but he either found ways to co-transform them and maintain them stably or like shear and fuse them. This, this is before sequencing and even I think at the beginning of like gel electrophoresis. So it's kind of you know, just raw genetics. His patent request was um, uh, they applied for a patent probably knowing that it was going to get denied because of the guidelines. Um, it got denied. They appealed it. They won in a patent court, which is kind of like an appeals court for patents, which scientists no longer exist, exist anymore. There's uh, no longer that system. And they ruled with GE and Chakrabarty and then went to the Supreme Court. Uh, so the kind of the decision broadly is that, well, there's really nothing special about um, life. So if you can uh, combine aspects of life in non-obvious and novel ways, that should be patentable. And uh, they, they drew a lot of the precedents from like the congressional action on plants. Who was Diamond? Is that just like the Attorney General or something? Or like, what is the he's the head of the patent office. Of the patent office. So he's like the, I can't remember if he's a respondent or he, he's the one who's appealing to the Supreme Court because he lost at the lower level. So in the, the <coughs> you know, two, three decades since then, a, a lot changed obviously with biotech. Um, so gene patents became a really big thing. Up. 
Uh, so shown here is the, the patent, which is at the center of the, the Myriad case, which is basically a patent for the BRCA1 gene, which you may know is a, a gene, it's involved in DNA repair, and mutations of it are like incredibly predictive for the risk of breast cancer. And so if you just read the claims of this patent, it's very striking. Like, um, you patent isolated <coughs> DNA containing at least 50 nucleotides in the DNA of this gene. Um, so you can already maybe think that there's issues with that. Um, at about the point when the Myriad decision was decided, there were gene patents covering 40% of known human genes. I think a lot of them were owned by Clark Bender and his various people. Big surprise. Uh, <coughs> So problem number one, uh, first of all, a 50 mer is a really short sequence, I'm sure you're kind of all familiar with. If you just assume um, like the human genome is completely random, you need at least 16 base pairs to identify your position in the human genome, and then you probably would need quite a bit more if there's any degeneracy or bias in the sequence, which there has to be because it's sequence coding. And there are actually some, some regions where you need like over several KB uh, because it will match in multiple uh, so BRCA1, for example, has 15 MERS that match uh, like almost 700 other genes. Uh, so what does a patent for that mean? And this was actually brought up in uh, the APF in the Myriad case. Uh, secondly, patents are almost always uh, made in the form of like just a letter, like the DNA sequence letters. But those letters aren't actually what DNA are. And this is maybe a small point, but like uh, epigenetic marks uh, really matter sometimes in certain contexts. Like if you're, you know, digest in your plasma and that matters. And then also just more fundamentally, DNA is not about letters, it's a very helpful. And the other problem is that a lot of these patents are based on the fact uh, by saying like, well, you're not patenting the thing in nature, you're patenting the isolated DNA. And so there actually was discussion that the really the important distinction is the fact that you don't have these bonds here, so these functional groups are different. And that seems like a bit of a stretch. So this all, kind of a lot of um, uh, gnashing of teeth over the system led up to a really good test case uh, for people that didn't want genes to be patentable, um, which started uh, with this company, Myriad Genetics, which is a startup spun out of the University of Utah. Uh, and they had patents, like pretty much all the patents for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And, uh, if you follow Supreme Court cases closely, you might notice that for whatever side you're, you're supporting, it's really good to have a good test case, something that's very sympathetic. Um, whether or not the judges actually take that into account, they probably shouldn't, but uh, you want you know, public support on your side. And so Myriad, um, in patenting these genome sequences, basically blocked everyone else from doing diagnostic breast cancer testing. They wouldn't license them out. They sent cease and desist letters to universities that were doing it. Um, granted, it was like, wasn't covered under the research exemption because they were charging for diagnostic tests at, you know, at hospitals, but even still, it's not great PR. Um, so then this moved up. Uh, originally, uh, a judge named Sweet ruled in favor of the challengers, this pathology society, and then a uh, University of Pennsylvania, which was blocked from doing diagnostic testing. It went up to the Court of Appeals, uh, where they were actually scientists on that panel, and they were people that were trained in science. And they reversed the decision really in favor of Myria, and then that's what led up to um, the Supreme Court case. And the holding of that is that um, genomic DNA um, is naturally occurring, so this distinction isn't big enough to uh, change its <coughs> nature from a naturally occurring molecule, uh, and is therefore ineligible under Section 101. So Section 101, just to remind you, is what gives people the right to patent, and it, it, it has the footnotes about you can't uh, patent something that's naturally occurring. Um, they did decide there's another uh, question of whether cDNA, uh, this is, you know, not, not um, whatever they said, but not much DNA is eligible. Uh, and the court said, we basically <coughs> will say that cDNA is eligible under 101 because cDNA doesn't exist um, natively in, in nature. Um, but we're going to make no decision uh, regarding the other sections, like uh, novelty, 102, or non-obviousness, 103. And I think right away you can see that if someone was going to challenge uh, non-obviousness, that might not have a, a good, good standing. Because uh, once someone makes CDNA, you can make anything in CDNA. Uh, 
Um, some other just very small interesting points of this, uh, this whole case. Um, there is a really clever uh, brief in support of AMP and UPenn by Eric Lander. And it basically said that if you look at the human genome or the human bloodstream, there's fragments of DNA floating around. Like you might have heard that these recent um, fetal screening tests will actually um, isolate fetal DNA from the mother's uh, bloodstream, and you can actually reconstitute the entire genome. And there's also a lot of human, uh, or the mother's DNA will also be there as well. So he said, well, you know, these are not the full genome; these are fragments. Therefore, it exists in nature, <clears throat> and it's very rare for like such a nuanced uh, uh, amicus brief or front of the court brief. Uh, to get discussed. Uh, friendly the corporate you almost don't get discussed that very often. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. And then in this, this kind of mini course I went to in Patent Law, uh, George Church was one of the speakers, and he said he was approached by the ACLU, which joined on this case, and then they decided that he was too much of a loose cannon. So they, <laughs> they, they, they stuck at the lander and other people. <laughs> so the aftermath of Myriad, um, if you just look on the different IP blogs, it ranges from like, this is awful. One person said like, biotech's been taken behind a shed and shot, which is a little dramatic, uh, <laughs> to basically people saying like, we basically moved on already. Um, several reasons why this, for Myriad, this is actually not that big of a deal, is that their patents were all expiring pretty much in 2014, and this was decided in 2013. Um, also, with the cDNA issue, even though you could challenge it on 103 for non-obviousness, uh, cDNA is not as useful anymore. If you're doing a diagnostic test, you're probably a lot of people aren't using Illumina now, which is moving into that space. And so that effectively is using an isolated genomic DNA. And then finally, uh, Myriad, uh, going back to trade secrets, their trade secrets are they have massive databases from 20 years of genetic testing. And so they have like a two-fold higher predictive ability than any other company. Um, so their, I think their stock stocks went down and back up when people like freaked out and realized, oh, okay, the company still has stuff of value. So consequences of this case, I think, are still not that clear. Um, some of, of it is kind of mitigated by changes in the field. Uh, you could you could make an argument. Um, so I, I mean, you could probably tell. I think that this decision was, was pretty well made. Although there are good arguments. Side. Um, one, uh, ignoring the law, one issue is that the less stuff you can patent, the more people want to make sure to uh, have trade secrets. Like this, so before Myriad would um, work with academia more often and publish uh, data on like um, how certain mutations correspond with risk, and they're not doing that anymore. Um, so that means they are at an advantage. And so that's just like a question, Jim. Yeah. So <clears throat> to summarize the finding of the period case was that you cannot patent genes, but you can patent cDNA. Uh, yes. So they so patent cDNA under like that one one statute. So a good Supreme Court case, uh, decision or any is is only is as narrow as it needs to be. And so they just focus on 101, and they say we'll leave 102 and 103 for later if necessary. So in practice, can you still patent sequences of DNA? It depends on what the patent office says. I think yes. Okay. So um, it's actually it's on here. Where are we now? Okay. Yeah, so I'll you, yeah, I'll, I'll just go back and finish this part. Um, the other issue, <laughs> which, this might be a wash for startups, but you could argue that this makes things better for startups because you don't have to worry about all these nonsense, uh, nonsense human gene patents. You can just do whatever you want. If you're a diagnostic company and you have an aluminum machine. Um, on the other side, you could argue, well, you can patent uh, DNA sequences as easily. So if you like are mining uh, microbiome sequences, maybe there's less IP there. So I'm actually not sure that there's a huge change. Can you patch the protein, like, as opposed to the gene sequence? I think I did see a lot of discussion on this, but I think the same Everything here applies to um, protein sequences. So it's actually yes. naturally occurring. If that protein is naturally occurring, you can. So there's an yeah. amino acid change cut off. So, like, pass uh, so percent IDP on an amino acid basis before you get that. Uh, 
you know what percent? The, I think it was like 60, something around 60. <laughs> uh, because I know that like, some companies will then do certain different permutations that you start to put on it's not even different, and then your amino acid identity is solution. And that way you can have something that's new, you know, it's the same pole, function by the same You can also probably code on optimize to change the identity. Well, but it's, it's on the amino acid level. Uh, oh, so but if you need to get away from the DNA level. Just change the criteria to like you know assume the circular like polypeptide and then run the group like sequence analysis. Yeah. It's also tricky with like identity stuff. Like identity, there's no objective way to determine identity, right? So it, it was it's interesting seeing all these rules and patents and like there's no clear answer in how to deal with them in science. And then you think about judges dealing with it. It just seems like a nightmare. But I can't think of anything better either. So, um, so to explain this question, where are we now? Um, so the first point is that it seems that if you isolate a wild type or naturally occurring variant sequence, um, even though this case focused on humans, presumably all organisms are patent ineligible. And I, I think, actually, I don't know about protein, so I'll just tell you that. Um, I was trying to find if there were challenges specifically on 102 and 103, and I really couldn't find a lot of discussion about it, which was kind of interesting. But I think that you could see in the future more challenges on those sections, because the 101 is pretty much decided for now, or something would have to change for there to be another decision on 101. So 101, 102, 103, you need one of those in order to make you need all that? three. You need all three. Yeah. Okay, well. You, you need to not violate any of the things you can't patent, and then it has to be um, novel and not obvious. And each oh, right. each section has its own corpus of court decisions and you know, guidelines. Uh, so this is why patent lawyers make a lot of money. So Gene, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the original Chakrabarty case, was it argued that it's non-obvious to take a plasma from one bacteria and put it into another bacteria? So the argument, I think, was that it's not obvious to so what Chakrabarty really did is that uh, there were no good methods at the time of transforming multiple plasmids or maintaining multiple plasmids in Pseudomonas, which is what he did. And it wasn't just a matter of like uh, proliferation or something like that. So there was some you know, some sophisticated manipulations. Like would a patent that patent exist nowadays? Like probably not, but at the yeah, time it's interesting because like the, the foundation of the field seems to be like if it was ruled today. Yeah, but like if you think about it, like non-obvious changes is a function of time. So like if, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's difficult. I agree. Yeah, I feel like you could have just patented the method for you know, getting it in. Yeah, getting plasma for the cell. So it might be worth reading um, the the dissenting opinion, which I wanted to get to, but I didn't. Um, to see what they said, because like I think everyone agreed that. Um, his method patents were fine. And there, I think there was three claims. One was the method patent. Two was like a composition of straw plus bacteria, which you put on the oil spill. And the third was the bacteria. And everyone was fine with the first two. It was the third, which was really the Supreme Court of the case. Um, okay, so the third thing's, the big things that you can patent. So first of all, uh, if you evolve the sequence, uh, a kind of non-naturally uh, occurring variants, or or made a new sequence which is novel, not obvious, and useful, then you can have that. You mean like if you made a synthetic genome? Yes. If you. Probably yeah. I mean, that still that still gets tricky because like you know, um, there has to be a non-obvious step, and then also it can't be the same as the human genome, but. Yeah, I, I'm not sure with the George Church stuff if they're talking mainly about methods and path patents. Um, which is, of course, uh, you, you could have had methods. And then, obviously, based on chocolate party, as we discussed, you could like um, patent an organism which combined, uh, like if you, if you made very novel plasmids and put them together in an organism, you could have that strain. Like shuffle or something? Yeah, you could patent shuffle, I think. Oh, so yeah, huge footnote is that 
this is not a constitutional issue. This is a statutory issue. It's based on the laws. So um, if you convince enough uh, senators and Congress people, they could just change this completely. And the Supreme Court case would be invalid. And there's like famous cases like, I don't know if you've heard the stories about the Ripper case. That involves a Supreme Court decision in which Congress in the 90s said, like, we don't like the decision. It's a statutory. We're going to rewrite the law. And Congress is allowed to do that. So then the final thing I'd like to, to kind of question is that, um, do we need more scientist judges? So I think we have enough scientists have lawyers. Um, and there'd probably be motivation for that, but there's probably less people that go the route to be a public servant. And um, there's a really famous uh, judge named Learned Hand, which is kind of a ridiculous name. <laughs> <laughs> but he was uh, known for being an excellent writer and uh, jurist, and then also uh, someone who was really fascinated by patent law, which I think was rare for judges. And uh, he, he basically said, like, it's hilarious that um, someone who knows like nothing about chemistry can like decide these decisions. It was a, a, chem a chemical patent case, I think. And he apparently worked very hard to like research this and get people to work with him to research it. And it still thought it was weird that he was doing this. And also in the Myriad case, um, Scalia wrote this really interesting uh, concurrence, which concurrence is basically when you say like, yeah, I agree with this decision, but I want to like say something else. And he basically said that like. Yeah, this decision, decision's correct, but like I really don't understand this molecular biology. And like credit to him for saying this, I think. Like this kind of ties into the learn and hand stuff. And um, in some ways you can't escape the fact that the Supreme Court has to be the final arbiter in this, these cases, but you could imagine that maybe we need to restore uh, there's an argument that we need to restore like a certain track of appeals courts that are staffed with scientists and that the Supreme Court can really like lean on them for their expertise. Um, although that being said, like you can make an argument that it will, if they come from certain industries, like maybe they'll be biased, but regardless, like it would be helpful, I think, to have more expertise in this field. That's it. Copyrights, unlike patents where you have to apply for a patent, 
as soon as you write it, it's copyrighted. Uh, so if there's ever an issue later, if you can just show that you, write, you wrote it, it'll be copyrighted. Um, but you, you can uh, copyright your pieces with one of these um, uh, copyrights or copyrights which have um, stronger fair use cases. We basically say, like, for example, um, anyone can copy this or as long as you cite it, uh, and then you can't uh, sell it, basically. Um, and I think a lot of it's very creative, and there's a lot of um, opportunities for, for this, too. George Church in his talk also talked about that, and he's pretty interested in that. Although he also, of course, is not opposed to, like, you know, like a lot of petting and a lot of stuff he does, which, like, you know, he's a lot to do. Um, 